Well, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law for the first of our afternoon panel discussion. It's great to see you here on such a beautiful afternoon and particularly during March Madness. So thank you all for uh, coming. Um, my name is Dan Badansky. I'm one of the faculty co-directors of the Center for Law and Global Affairs and I'm a foundation professor. I teach public international law here at Arizona State University. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, the organizers of this conference who've done just a tremendous job, Jennifer Hammerschmidt and Zari Panosian. So please join me in thanking them for uh, doing this. Uh, our topic this afternoon is legal aspects of genocide generally and the Armenian genocide in particular. And as Daniel Rothenberg, our first speaker, will be discussing in his remarks, at the time of the Armenian Genocide, the concept of genocide did not yet exist. Uh, it wasn't developed until almost 30 years later by um, Raphael Lemkin, who lost 49 of his family members during the Holocaust. Um, but this didn't mean that the Armenian Genocide wasn't understood even at the time in terms of international criminal law. A joint declaration by France, Great Britain, and Russia in May 1950, 1915 described the massacres of Armenians by Turkey as, quote, crimes against humanity, the first time that term had been used. And during the interwar period, Lemkin wrote on international criminal law issues and specifically on what he called the crime of barbarity, a precursor of the crime of genocide. The Armenian case was very much on his mind when he developed the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the international treaty addressing this subject today. To discuss the issue of genocide from a legal perspective, we have a very distinguished panel. And they'll each be speaking for about 15 or 20 minutes, followed by time for questions and answers and more general discussion. So let me just briefly introduce each of them and then turn it over to them. Um, our first speaker today is Daniel Rothenberg, who's a professor of practice at the School of Public Politics and Global Affairs, a Lincoln Fellow for Ethics and International Human Rights, and co-director of the Center for the Future of War, a joint project of ASU and the New America Foundation in Washington, DC. Daniel has worked for many years in the field on human rights issues in places ranging from Iraq and Afghanistan to Guatemala and Peru to most recently the Congo. He's been a senior fellow at the Orville Schell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School and is the author of numerous articles and books, including on the Guatemalan Truth Commission and more recently on drones. He'll be giving a general introduction to the concept of genocide in international law. Our second speaker over here on my left uh, is Mark Garagos, and he really needs no introduction. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him from his work as a legal analyst on CNN. Mark is a principal at the firm of Garagos and Garagos, where he's represented clients such as Winona Ryder, Michael Jackson, and Mike Tyson, among many others. He served as president of the National Trial Lawyers Association in his book, Mistrial, an inside look at how the criminal justice works and sometimes doesn't, was a bestseller and won the grand prize at the 2014 Los Angeles Book Festival. Mark represented descendants of Armenian genocide victims in a class action suit brought against two insurance companies uh, for insurance policies issued to Armenians in Turkey prior to 1915. And he'll be speaking on the issue of the internet, uh, restitution for the crime of genocide. Uh, third, we'll be hearing from Professor Najwa Napti of the University of Arizona Law School. Najwa worked for six years in the prosecutor's office at the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, the precursor of the International Criminal Court, where she specialized on gender-based uh, crimes and persecution and served on the prosecuting sexual violence working group in the prosecutor's office. She'll be focusing on the issue of sexual violence uh, in the context of the Armenian Genocide, specifically in uh, genocide uh, crimes more uh, generally. And then finally, our last panelist is Bob Clinton, who's a foundation professor here at ASU College of Law. 
Bob's teaching and research focuses on federal Indian law, uh, tribal law, constitutional law, and federal courts. He serves as Chief Justice of the Winnebago Supreme Court and an Associate Justice for the Colorado River Indian Tribes Court of Appeals, the Hopi Court of Appeals, uh, and many others. He's also authored the Handbook of Federal Indian Law and co-authored American Indian Law, uh, among his many other publications. He'll be speaking to us today on the concept of genocide with relation to Native American issues. So without that, let me turn it over to Daniel, who's going to be giving some opening remarks on the crime of genocide generally in international law. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks so much for everyone for coming to this conference. It's really a pleasure to be here. And the organizers, as, as Professor Badansky just mentioned, have really done an incredible job of putting all of this together. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, so what I want to talk with you about is, is the, a couple of different issues related to the legal concept of genocide. So genocide is, you know, one of the most, maybe one of the best known, popular, popularly best known of international criminal concepts. And yet I would suggest to you that it's actually fairly poorly understood, or rather the legal meaning of the term is not well understood by those who often deploy it generally. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this history that, that Dan mentioned a little with, you know, we're here honoring the 100th year anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, and as Dan mentioned, that action occurred before there was an international legal, before there was even a term genocide, and before there was any sort of criminal structure put into place to accomplish the particularities of that kind of crime, right? Not, which isn't to say that much of what occurred wasn't illegal under other kinds of concepts, but there was a reason, right? There was a demand that led to the creation of the term genocide, and it's an interesting history. I won't go into the full history, but I want to go into a couple of key points. So I'll do an overview of the crime of genocide, outline a couple of complexities in the term that, that, um, that aren't always recognized. Um, I'm going to argue that there are basic tensions within the meaning of genocide between three different understandings, and that these tensions are rarely dealt with explicitly, so they produce a lot of misunderstanding, and that's between the legal meaning, which we'll go into, and then something I'd call the social or sociological meaning, and then something we could call the moral meaning or ethical meaning. Um, and genocide encompasses, it, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, which is complex for any term. I mean, lots of terms have multiple meanings, but what's difficult about genocide for popular discussions is that it's used as if it means the same thing for all, but in fact, for a set of reasons, it can't actually. And that's what I want to get into. So, um, so what is genocide? Just so, right, there's not a, the easiest answer, and frankly, if you do reading on the subject, even if you go onto websites, one thing that's fascinating about it, I don't know if it's, it seems like it's echoing a lot. <laughs> One thing that's fascinating about the term is that it actually has close to the identical legal definition in a multiplicity of different legal documents. So the exact same definition in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention reappears in the International Criminal Court statute, in the statutes of the Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, and interestingly, in the many, there's lots of different domestic legislation. So I don't want to say that there's no difference as you go around the world, because no doubt there is. But in general, unlike other kinds of crimes, human rights violations, there's almost the identical definition in the vast majority of places where the term is defined. And really briefly, if you're not familiar, I'll just read to you Article 2 of the Convention. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts, we'll get acts, committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, eth ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And then there's a list of five acts, I'll be fast. Killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So I'll go into each of these things, but it's an interesting definition. It has a kind of clarity as international conventions seek to produce, right? Um, but within the term, if you want to like break it down, it's, it's fairly short. If you want to break it down, there's sort of three key components. There's a lot of discussion about the term, and, it, and we can go into each component with a lot of depth, but very briefly, there's intent. So the crime requires the intent, so the purposeful, the, again, intent can mean different things, but 
the, there's the intent to destroy in whole or in part one of four enumerated groups. So that's a key issue, and it becomes very complex in a lot of the jurisprudence on genocide, and is one of the key issues that's a sort of like stumbling block for a lot of popular discussions of genocide. And then there's the group identity. So you could imagine, I mean, genocide's a fascinating international crime, right, or any kind of crime, in that it only operates through the direction of actions against group identity, right? These actions can be illegal under lots of different legal systems, but what makes it genocide, there has to be the targeting of a group, and not just any group, at least according to the international definition, but four different types of groups, racial groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, and national groups. Now, there was, during the, the preparatory discussions of the Genocide Convention, lots of debate as to what the, the enumerated groups ought to be, but the way we are now, and there's quite a substantial debate among scholars, particularly, and of activists as well, about expanding that definition so that some of the problems of the definitional groups get, get remedied. Um, but for now, at least in, in its widespread understanding, it's one of these four groups, racial, ethnic, religious, and national. And then finally, there's five enumerated kinds of actions. So you can make a claim that, that, that there's genocide when you have the intent to destroy in whole or in part. And the in whole or in part is also a subject of a lot of complexity because the question becomes, you know, how do we make sense of in whole or in part? And, and then there's the, the four groups and we have to understand those groups. And then there's the five enumerated actions. So it isn't that hard to, you know, read the convention and see these, this definition and it has a sort of plain language meaning in on one hand, right? But within each of these terms, there's enormous complexity. And not only is there complexity, there's the kind of complexity that runs counter to popular understandings of the term. So, for example, if we look at first protected group, it seems unproblematic if you would imagine or even look at real world cases of enormous destructive activity designed to do great harm to some group that most of those cases would fall fairly unproblematically within the definition of genocide. And you might go a step farther, which is, to the degree they didn't fall into the definition, there'd be something wrong with that concept. And this turns out to be a big area of debate and discussion. Now, I'll give you a really concrete example. So the, the devastating violence committed by the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia, devastating by any measure, I mean, any kind of quantitative measure, any qualitative measure, you know, the numbers killed, we have no idea, but they, they commonly go well over a million, and, and, they're, and they're not accurately calculated. But there was just absolute, you know, incredible acts of political violence committed against millions of people. And just almost the attempt to refashion an entire society within a particular ideological vision. Nevertheless, the majority of victims of the Khmer Rouge, or, or Cambodians, as we could call them now, are their ethnic Khmer. And they shared virtually all of the kind of group identity constructions of the genocide conviction, convention between the perpetrators and the victims. So, one of the, so you think, well, how could the Cambodian genocide not be a genocide? It looks, it encompasses the horror that genocide is meant to name. And yet, it's a serious question, and even, and when I say a serious question, I don't just mean debated and discussed in sort of abstract forum, I mean concretely so in the extraordinary tribunals that are designed to prosecute a small number of the remaining Khmer Rouge leaders in Cambodia, the, the, the charge of genocide is not a key element, not an element of, of the prosecution. It's a focus on other kinds of crimes because of this complexity that you could have somebody, you could have extraordinarily compelling evidence against somebody, um, and yet you couldn't make a substantive genocide claim if you couldn't show that there was the intent to destroy and whole in part that group. And what's come out of the Cambodia case, I just want, it's useful to talk about because most people know something about it, 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 it's been the kind of a term that existed, it first arose among scholars, which was autogenocide. That somehow there could be this idea that, that groups could, could involve in genocide, you commit genocide against their own group. But if you process that, it becomes an enormously complicated idea if you want to preserve the sort of vibrancy of this term genocide. So that's just one example, and I would suggest to you that there are many, many examples where the concept of destroying a group in whole or in part, or even identifying the group, is enormously complex. And you see this time and time again when the legal instruments that define genocide are put into practice through some sort of formal, uh, some sort of formal investigative body that uses international law as its foundation, or even more so where you have court cases. And there's quite a few court cases now. Although something that may also be interesting, it's not only that 
the, the, the evolution of genocide uh, work and the evolution of thinking about genocide has taken quite a bit of time. I mean, we had uh, the Armenian genocide is, I think, being a key touchstone in the evolution of an understanding that there needed to be a term and there needed to be me formal mechanisms with some teeth to address crimes of that severity, to name those crimes, because there was no term to name them before, and then to also construct at least you know, the, the beginnings of a structure to, to, to act uh, uh, in response. So, um, interestingly, you would think even though the Genocide Convention, Genocide convention is, is also of significance, is really the first international human rights convention, if you want to view it through that rubric. Uh, it was open for signature, so allowed for states were allowed to, to take on its obligations in 1948, and it entered into force, which is to say it became a legally binding instrument in 1951 for those states that accepted the obligations. So, and this far predates a lot of the, the, the sort of core human rights conventions that we rely on, those who follow this kind of world, right? So, you, the, so the, the core human rights conventions weren't, uh, the, the weren't open for signature until 66 and didn't go into a force until 76. So this was really at the very early stage of the evolution of international human rights work. And it has a foundational role in this discourse and in this practice. Nevertheless, it took many, many years before there was the first international prosecution and, sub, and subsequent conviction for anyone for genocide under international law, and that was with the creation of this international tribunal to address the horrors of, of Rwanda, the Rwandan genocide. And I, su I suggest to you that as you think of each of these genocides, or the ones you're familiar with, um, thinking through each of the three components, you'll see that there are potential counter arguments or complexities to understanding how this term applies to real world cases, particularly where the cases become, well, the many cases where the definitions are, are complex. So. The same is true for the actions of genocide. You would think that like genocide, as it's popularly understood, that this is something where the term would seem a lot like the practice that you think the term would name. But if you read these discussions, it's the, the five enumerated actions, uh, and it's one or more of these actions, so you could have a case of genocide that involved no killing, the tr forcible transfer of, stu of, of children from one group to another. That, that runs counter to the widespread understanding of what this concept means. And actually, as you go through each of the legal conceptions, I think you'd often find, or you, you find if you speak to, say, popular audiences, that they don't think that that's the thing genocide is, and yet that turns out to be an element. One can make a, a valid legal argument of a case of genocide in the absence of the sort of actions that you think would be at the core of this crime. Um, added to this, so, so, so each of these, I, we can, we can in, the, in the question period, we can talk about each of these components because for every one, there's enormous complexity, whether it's the issue of intent. As you might imagine, demonstrating intent is enormously complex. Uh, uh, you, you need to, particularly when it goes to sort of a legal, a legal forum. I mean, uh, one key example, again, that's worth reflecting on, and all this stuff is easily accessible online, is the Secretary General of the United Nations created a special expert committee to review the case of Darfur, one of the most famous genocides that's popularly known about for a long period of time. I think it's faded quite a bit, but it was one of the core places that, say, students would engage the issue of genocide in a concrete way. There are all sorts of movements, Save Darfur. Um, even though the genocide itself has not, has not stopped, the movement seems to have lost a lot of its vibrancy, at least on campuses. But in any case, the, the UN Expert Committee, when it reviewed the available data and it sent teams of investigators to gather material the best they could, to view documentary um, sources, as well as to interview folks in refugee camps and to seek to interview whoever they could get information from, they came to the determination that as horrific as the violence in uh, Darfur was that it didn't constitute genocide. Not because the actions weren't adequate to show, to, to meet that legal definition, but because they couldn't gather adequate information to meet what they saw as the, the limitation of intent. Now again, the, this didn't, they didn't suggest that you couldn't make the claim, they suggested they didn't have the adequate evidence to reach that, but it's a pretty compelling claim and it was a very big deal, as you might imagine, excuse me, to, the, to advocates for this issue because it didn't seem possible the United Nations, you know, this core international body charged partly with, with defending fundamental human rights around the world, could somehow come to this conclusion and, the, and, the, and the, the individual experts on the panel were absolutely 
you know, top global experts on this issue. So the, those examples give you an idea of the complexity of the legal definition. And, and frankly, the complex emotional response of those who are directly related to genocide, either, either through sort of their, their own personal experience, their familial experience, or their engagement with activist movements, the sort of slap in the face it must be when cases of genocide, when claims of genocide are found not to meet the legal definitions. And then the, the, the reverse is also true, which is where you see claims of genocide, for example, in Guatemala, where the Guatemalan Truth Commission came to the determination that the state had committed genocide against indigenous groups during the brutal civil war of the early 1980s. And, and, and then subsequent to that, there was a domestic prosecution on the issue against the highest ranking um, head of the military dictatorship at a key period of time. Uh, there also, this, there was an enormous social rejection of that claim much more so than the other serious human rights claims made in the various reports that have, the many, many reports that have come out about abuses committed by the state in the country. So, such a, so much of a rejection that when the initial Truth Commission report was presented, the president refused to, to formally receive it, refused to get up on stage. And since then, there's been an incredibly kind of intense debate in, uh, after these domestic prosecutions. So what does all this get to? These other key points about genocide. I tried to provide a, a very a kind of a quick overview because of the definition legally, but there are two other components of the, of the term that I think are really key. One is moral. I think that resonates powerfully with all of us, which is to say, uh, even as the UN independent expert um, uh, on a uh, special rapporteur on genocide said, genocide is the worst crime it is possible to commit. I think the term resonates popularly with that sentiment, that it is the, like, the lowest level that human society can fall, that those who commit genocide have crossed a line to barbarity, that needs a special name, that requires a special response, that exists at a level of moral condemnation that is particular and unique to this crime. Often, though, when these ideas are processed through sort of more rational means of legal systems, that passion can't be, that it can't be fully respected. So the moral demand is enormously significant for the term, and yet it's complexly, often operates in complex tension with the legal meaning. And similarly, the sociological determination is also fascinating and complex because the crime requires a group victim, and it requires clear determinations about group identity. And without going too much complexity to this, as you can imagine, group identity is enormously complex, and not everyone agrees on what group identity is. It's difficult to prove. Um, in the case, for example, of the Rwandan genocide, one of the key useful ways to show group identity was, was state ID cards, because it had a crisp specificity to it, as opposed to the greater complexity of subjective understanding of who you are. So really briefly, the legal definition of genocide and its meaning, the social definition and its meaning, um, and the moral definition and its meaning are often in complex tension with each other. I don't suggest that there's an answer to this tension. I don't wanna, it isn't the kind of problem for which you can simply come up with a construction that resolves those tensions. But I would suggest to anybody who's interested in this term and this concept and in doing something with it, in using the term to, to, to produce certain kinds of actions, that there's, there's a, a, there's a value to acknowledging its inherent complexity and the fact that it doesn't, that genocide does not mean a single thing and that the discourses of genocide actually are often in conflict with each other in ways that are important to recognize for sort of productive action. So thanks so much. Calling on people after we finish with all four of the speakers. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Garrigus. In the interests of full disclosure, I am a proud shish kebab Armenian, which, which for those of you who don't know means I don't have the IAN. When my grandfather traveled through Ellis Island many years ago, fleeing the genocide, uh, he uh, dropped the IAN thinking that that, he was told at Ellis Island that would make a good American out of him. And um, so now everybody thinks I'm Greek. So uh, <laughs> it is what it is, although we do share a common antipathy towards the Turks. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's not all bad. The, um, when I was asked to come speak here about the legal framework of genocide, uh, and especially given the fact that we're at a kind of a momentous time, uh, for, with the 100th commemoration, uh, I think back to 
a guy who's a personal hero of mine became a client of mine and kind of changed the course or the direction of my um, career. And that was a gentleman by the name of Martin Marutian. And Marty was a pharmacist uh, who lived in La Cunada, where I grew up, which is right next to Glendale. For those of you who don't know, that's Yerevan West. Um, and Marty, for years, had been trying to collect on a policy from New York life insurance that had been issued during the time of the Ottoman Empire. And this policy was probably worth about $300 if you translated it. And he had been writing letters, and the policy was on his uncle, but the beneficiary was Marty's mother. And he'd been writing letters every 10 or 15 years to New York Life, trying to collect on this $300 policy. And it was a matter of principle for Marty. And could not get any traction, obviously. New York Life would ignore him and send letters and back to him or form letters back. And he came in and talked to me. And I uh, knew Marty because, uh, you know, for those of you who are going to law school, you never know where your client's going to come from. I had dated his daughter, Vanessa, when I was in high school. So Marty thought uh, that he could kind of <laughs> guilt me into taking the case. Um, but I had talked with my father, Pops, uh, who was my then partner and is my hero, um, still alive today, but uh, retired. And, and Pops and Marty knew each other through various organizations and through the St. Gregory Armenian Church and said, let's take a flyer on it, and we did. And this was going back into the late 90s. And one of the first things that we had to deal with was the fact that obviously this policy was issued during the Ottoman Empire by New York Life. And how do you file in California for, to sue a company for a policy that was issued, you know, back then it was 85 years prior to that. So we had gone to the legislature, and one of the good things about living in California is that we do have a very vibrant community that understands that if you want to get things done, you need to have a political presence as well. And we passed a statute in California that extended the statute of limitations. Back then it was for 10 years, from the year 2000 to the year 2010. And it was called the Armenian, and we used in the statute the term Armenian Genocide. That statute compelled companies that were doing business in the state of California to have made, to have honored their contracts basically. And obviously New York Life was one of those companies. So we filed suit against New York Life in the federal district court in Los Angeles. And we got assigned the case and we litigated uh, back and forth and um, we came through um, at a certain point um, with what's called the discovery phase and in the discovery phase what one of the things that we learned is we went back to the archives in New Jersey where New York Life had them stored and we actually saw I'm in a barn main plate we found these cards and they probably more like about this size and the cards were um, kept in the, uh, the archives, and they literally would list the policyholder, the occupation, the village, their kids' names, the wife's names, and each date when you paid the premium, somebody would write on the date. And so you take a look at it, you had a real-time kind of record of, and New York Life obviously as an insurance company is all about the records, they wanted to see exactly um, who was paying and made sure that the premium was paid. Well, one of the things that we noticed, and I, I said this was my um, undergraduate degree, which was in sociology and anthropology, which my father used to tease me, that and a quarter would buy you a cup of coffee. But I noticed that if you charted when the premium payment stopped, it stopped in every village on the same date. And you could chart the course of the genocide by village by village as to when the premium payments stopped. And it was a, I get chills every time I think about it. It was a real time, actual, uh, real world evidence of what was going on back then. And we eventually settled the case for $20 million, which we were very proud of at the time because that marked the first time that anybody, Holocaust or genocide related, had ever settled a case that revolved around that act. Because 
the, when the Jewish lawyers and one of the lawyers that I had as my co-counsel, Bill Chernoff, had started the Holocaust litigation and had done the same thing, basically gone and gotten a statute and everything else, they were, they were preempted, basically, because there was a government-to-government -government solution. The U.S. government had agreed with the German government and other um, European governments to solve it, and that took the controversy out of the courts. And so Bill had gotten nowhere with the Holocaust litigation, but we were successful with the New York Life litigation. And one of the things we also noticed was that during, the, because there was such a high risk, and mind you, these policies, there was some 9,000 policies that we had come across, and at least half of them were Armenians, and the rest were mixed between Greeks and Assyrians and other assorted ethnicities. But we noticed that New York Life had done something that insurance companies often do, which is they had engaged in what's called reinsurance. And so they had these policies, they sold off some of the policies, and the, one of the companies that we noticed they had sold off to was a French company that the literal translation was Father Cash Register. And I always loved that name for an insurance company. I want, if you want to buy insurance, you want your company to be called Father Cash Register. But Father Cash Register apparently didn't survive long. They were bought by AXA, and so we ended up suing AXA, which is a giant conglomerate out of Paris, um, and we were getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere. We just could not get any traction with the case. They didn't want to engage. And at about the same time, I was um, asked by Larry King, so some of you who are old enough may remember, he used to have a show on CNN. He was doing his 20th anniversary show, and Larry said um, that he wanted me to be a guest on his 20th anniversary show. And I said, I'd be happy to do it, but we can talk about whatever topic, whatever tabloid, sensational criminal case there is, but the last two segments, you gotta ask me what I'm working on now. He said, Mark, I'm happy to do it. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and man of his word, he traveled down to wherever I was in trial, somewhere in Orange County, and they set up in the hotel that I was basically living in as, as I was in trial. And sure enough, we talked about missing white women or whatever the tabloid story of the day was, but the last two segments he said, Mark, uh, what are you working on now? And I proceeded to go on and explain that we were suing AXA and it was about the Armenian genocide and uh, went into, and he gave me the full two segments and it was great and I went back to court the next day on a completely separate case and went back to my trial. I got a call later that day after court from one of my co-counsel on the AXA case um, who said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He says, the general counsel, it's the lawyer, kind of in-house lawyer, from AXA just called, and he says they're, they're willing to enter into mediation on this case. I said, that's great. For those of you who don't know, mediation usually means the other side wants to pay. Okay, so that's, I hear word or hear law school for you law students, that's something that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> said, number two, they're willing to have Judge Dikron Tavrizian be the mediator. And I say, for those of you who are not aware, that's, you can tell he's Armenian. That's also a very good sign in a case where you're trying to recover benefits for Armenian descendants. He says, number three is the worst uh, possible um, precondition. I said, Brian, what's that? And he says, um, they also said you have to shut up and you can't go back on TV until after we do the mediation. I, said, <laughs> I understand, Brian, and I know you think I can't do it, but for this I will uh, shut up. And we went to the mediation and we did it in the Central District Court. Back then, Judge T uh, was uh, still sitting on the court. He was the first Armenian uh, district, federal district court judge. And uh, to his credit, he but got them to get up to about $17 million because they had, as a reinsurer, they had a lot less numbers, sheer numbers of policies. And I said, well, Judge T, that's great, 17 million, I can live with that, but um, I, I've got to do the due diligence and take a look at the premium cards and see what they've got in the archives. And I know that's in Paris and I know it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. So we're going to go to Paris and we're going to take a look at the, uh, the archives there. And um, so my then partner, now judge, um, Shelley Kaufman, who speaks French and um, uh, who had been with me at that point for maybe 10 or 12 years, and I went to Paris and um, we 
went through the archives and she picked up one of the cards as we were in the middle of it. And she said, Mark, do you think that this could be a relative of yours? And the name was Bogos Giragosian. And he was a, from Adana and he was a candy maker. It had the occupation on it. And I said, I will call my father and I'll ask Pops and see what he says. And I called up Pops, and for those of you who don't know, my, my father was a, when I was growing up, first 13 years of my life, uh, was a homicide prosecutor in Los Angeles. And he was a no-nonsense, tough-as-nails um, uh, type and who did not suffer fools lightly. In fact, I often joke, I thought for the, up until eighth grade that my first name was dumb and my middle name was shit, because that's usually <laughs> how he referred to me. Um, so I called up Pops and I said, Pops, do you think we're related to Bogos Giragosian, the candy maker from Adana? And in, you know, transported back to my youth, he said, Mark, you dumb shit. Um, Bogos was my uncle. That's who I was named after. My name is Paul. Um, he gave your grandfather, John, the $200, the, what would have been the equivalent of 200 bucks, to get to America, to go to Ellis Island, and, and land in Chicago and start the family. And I get goosebumps over that every time I tell this story. Here, in a, an amazing kind of um, uh, piece of serendipity, I could be sitting in France looking at Bogos Kirikosian's uh, premium card. So we went back to the general counsel and I said, no deal. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, you screwed Bogos out of, you know, the equivalent of 500 bucks back uh, then. That was my great uncle. And we spent about three days and they ended up upping the offer from 17 million to 17 and a half million, which I affectionately call the Bogos premium. Um, <laughs> and we settled the case. The, the, and uh, literally those people often ask, what are the proudest things you've ever done? And I, the genocide class actions are clearly settling those cases, being the, literally from the time of the tort or the breach of contract to the time of settlement is the, uh, as of right now, probably the historical record. And I, we're very proud of that. We are currently, you know, one of the other things uh, growing up as an Armenian, I often, um, uh, I don't know about some of you, but as me, we were often taught about the gutty little Armenians. You know, you were always losing a war here, we're losing a war there. There was always, we're getting overrun through history here, we're getting overrun through history there. You know, after a while you start to get a complex, but I, I think that's one of the reasons that I was always drawn to criminal defense, at least originally in my career, is because it was the idea of authority kind of overrunning the underdog and, and the idea that you could do something or that you could protect somebody who had had really no uh, voice to speak to power. The um, interesting thing is that, um, and in listening to the professor here about the, the word genocide, the Turks got very heavily involved. In fact, the, uh, the ambassador tried to interfere uh, with the Turkish ambassador tried to interfere with our case against the Ark Life and our case with AXA, sending letters to the judge, you know, trying to get in the middle of that. Mind you, we're sitting here suing in a civil court for policies that were paid for, and you're saying, why, is the, why are the Turks so upset about this? Well, the reason is the word genocide. And in fact, they, the Turks insinuated themselves into a, another case that we had where we sued a bank and we went up to the Ninth Circuit and it's a tortured history last year but we started we lost two to one where they invalidated the statute the court the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals because of the use of the word genocide in the statute because that was a unlawful this was the argument it was unlawful for the California State Legislature to venture into the foreign affairs doctrine that was exclusively the province of the feds. A more bullshit legal argument you could not make, but somehow they convinced two of the judges in the Ninth Circuit, who then flipped. We then, we asked for a rehearing, and they flipped, and we won. Well then, the Turkish ambassador writes to the Ninth Circuit, and we get granted an in-bank hearing in front of the entire Ninth Circuit, and they ruled the same way, that that was an unlawful act of the California legislature to put genocide in a statute because genocide was an unlawful um, uh, intrusion of the state into the foreign affairs doctrine. Um, 
we decided, well, okay, that's fine. We'll go back to the legislature and we'll propose a new statute. We'll take out genocide and we'll just say systematic annihilation of another people by the Turks. So that is what's on the boards. That's the, you know, be careful what you wish for. That's what they're going to get. At the same time, we sued the government of Turkey um, for the last 12 years. I've been collecting land deeds and I've got, I've, I have my mother's uh, always tell me about her pink marble house in Eintap, which they took, which I always, my father always said she's Eintapsy, and of course, um, it, he didn't think that was a geographical state. He said that's a state of mind. They think they're royalty. But, the, my, but I, at some point, about seven or eight years ago, I actually ran into a uh, older woman who actually knew of or had remembered the pink marble house in Eintap. So I'd always been collecting these deeds, and we sued the government of Turkey. We knew that we would not prevail at the district court level, and we got up to the Ninth Circuit. And just last month, um, you know, we had the oral argument set but the Ninth Circuit has now stayed that oral argument pending a case that's in front of the U.S. Supreme Court um, on the doctrine of sovereign immunity of the Turkish government. And I would suggest to you, the reason that the Turks are, are involved in this, the reason that they have bankrolled um, all of this genocide denial nonsense, um, they know better than anybody that the historical record is irrefutable. I mean, if they didn't, why would they be paying the Muslim mother, uh, Brotherhood a million dollars to destroy records in the archives in Egypt, I mean, which they did just last month? Why would they be spending $12 million a year with the former House Speaker Livingston? Why would they be spending $10 million a year with the former House Speaker Gephardt? Because they know what the end game is here, and they know as I've said, part of the problem with being what, our, what Armenians have done wrong about this approach has been we had uh, recognition. We had the R word. Um, President Reagan, to his credit, had recognized the Armenian genocide. The Congress, not once but twice, had recognized the genocide. We should have said, okay, we got there. Um, and moved on to the next R word, which is restitution and reparations. Because, as anybody will tell you who deals with criminal law, the only way to make a crime victim whole is through restitution. And that's what the Turks know, that's what they're deathly afraid of. The Turks do not want, they understand that once that is established, they're done. Under the current U.S. law, once it's established that they committed the crime of genocide, they no, have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide, and they must do pay restitution. So that is what this all comes down to. The uh, end game uh, ultimately will be when we prevail, um, either in the U.S. Supreme Court or when we go back and argue in the Ninth Circuit, and then get start to get the lands back because there will be nothing they can do at that point. They will have to return the lands. They'll have to give back as they've already started doing. Uh, if you've noticed, um, you know the for those of us, as I said, we, who were raised thinking that the we were always on the run as Armenians are always kind of the gutty little underdog. We re actually have quite a narrative at this point. Um, Nagora Harapa is a a victory of monumental proportions, um, which we don't talk about enough. I mean, the we are a nation that has now established a republic. Um, yes, does it have its growing pains? Yes, obviously, every former Soviet republic does. Uh, but we have um, victory after victory, and I would submit to you that it's only a matter of time. You know, we've started to retrieve some of the churches that were stolen. Um, we will get some of the other lands that were stolen. It's only a matter of time before Nagore Harapa is recognized as what it is, a democratically homegrown a state in a sea of Islamist uh, uh, terrorism. And at a certain point, I think Armenia will be viewed as kind of a beacon of democracy and, and for what it uh, truly is, a, the first Christian nation um, that uh, really has stood the test of time in, a, in the face of an unbelievable onslaught. It's ironic that this 100th year, and we talk about genocide and we talk about the Ottoman Turks, and then you see what's going on with ISIS and the, the same throwback. It's almost as if you watch history repeating itself. When my Odar friends, for those of you who don't know what an Odar is, that's you if you don't know what it is. Um, the, 
for my Odar friends when they say, why does this matter? Why should we talk about it 100 years afterwards? And I said, because if we don't talk about it 100 years afterwards, we're going to have groups like ISIS. We're going to have people who are murdering Christians uh, just for being Christians, or they're going to murder Shiites just for being Shiites, and, and this kind of nonsense that goes on, history repeating itself. So I would submit to you that there, there isn't a more um, topical, there isn't a more vibrant reason to be discussing genocide than what's going on in the world right now. I thank all of you for coming out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon to talk about a subject which obviously can be the, the, the worst. Uh, but if there is some hope, I will tell you, uh, I think that we really are on the forefront of, of turning it all around. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you to the organizers for putting together such an excellent conference and for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and um, humbling, actually, to be in the presence of uh, such extraordinary speakers who have dedicated their life's work to this issue. Um, I may have prevented a different order. That was a tough uh, act to follow, um, but I'll do my very best, perhaps, by um, changing the subject. Um, so I will be speaking about um, related harms, obviously, but in a different context, and that is the sexual violence against Armenian women and girls during the Armenian Genocide and its re relevance to efforts to prosecute similar crimes um, today. So when I first began studying this um, topic a bit more intensively, <clears throat> about a year ago, I, like most uh, Americans who were educated here in the United States didn't know very much about um, the Armenian Genocide. I didn't study it in school, um, but rather I learned about it from my fellow students in college who were Armenian or of Armenian descent. Um, and their stories, I remember, were so appalling that they were actually hard to believe. And yet, what they spoke about was not even the half of it it didn't include any of the sexual violence that I am now more aware of um, that had occurred. And so when in t late 2013, when my then colleague Alex Demergian, who um, was a fellow prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which I will call ICTY, it's quite of a mouthful, um, when he approached me and asked whether I'd be interested in researching and writing a chapter on sexual violence during the Armenian Genocide, I was more than intrigued because um, I, I had spent the past five years working on prosecutions at the appellate level involving sexual violence and other atrocities in the former Yugoslavia, including Croatia, Bosnia, and Kosovo. And what I discovered in my research astounded me not only the, that the historical record was replete of, with evidence of such crimes, but compared to international, current international criminal uh, prosecutions, there were a lot of similarities, including in how the crimes were committed, the overall context, driven by ethnic animus against targeted groups, and the varied use of sexual violence to achieve the end goals of ethnic cleansing and genocide, as well as the perpetration of sexual violence within a repeated pattern of crimes. Another notable similarity was the negative stigma associated with victims of sexual violence, their own shame and their fear of passing on that shame to their families and down through the generations. This fear um, kept many victims from ever disclosing the full truth about what happened to them after they were taken away. In the context of the Armenian Genocide, this has had long-lasting effects, which I will touch on briefly during my presentation and which will be addressed more fully by experts in another panel this afternoon. The context of, in the context of international criminal prosecutions, in addition to having these same effects, it has also made proving such crimes more difficult, as some witnesses were only willing to acknowledge 
um, the acts of sexual violence late in the proceedings, or were unwilling to testify and be subjected to further trauma on the witness stand. And yet in both contexts, some survivors were willing to come forward, risk everything, and tell the full truth. It is thanks to these courageous individuals that we now have international jurisprudence confirming that sexual violence can be a war crime, a crime against humanity, and an act of genocide. Thanks to them and the investigators, prosecutors, and witness protection personnel who worked with them, more than 30 perpetrators have been convicted involving in crimes involving sexual violence at the ICTY alone, with dozens of additional convictions before the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and other hybrid courts and national courts that are prosecuting these crimes as international crimes. I would like to address some of these similarities and shared difficulties and expand on what we can learn on them. First, I'll summarize the context in which sexual violence was perpetrated during the Armenian Genocide. Drawing on the work of historians and other scholars, such as Matthias Bjornland and Catherine Derdrian, who have published dedicated scholarship on this topic, and this is an area, um, as Dr. Akcham had mentioned yesterday, that is growing, more attention is being paid to it. And as a result, more, even more evidence is coming forward in primary sources. Second, I'll summarize how these acts are solidified at, as core crimes now under international criminal law. And third, I'll outline the continuing relevance of Armenian history in proving these crimes today. Reports of sexual violence against women and girls surfaced from the very outset of the massacres and the expulsion of entire Armenian villages in 1915. At every stage, women and girls were targeted. Military escorts, bands of criminals unleashed on them, civilians and Kurdish fighters employed by Ottoman authorities attacked convoys of deportees forced toward the desert. They abducted and sexually abused women and girls before killing them or leaving them to die. The threat of rape was so pervasive that many resorted to, to suicide. And as in most conflict settings, sexual violence was but one of the many traumas suffered by these victims. Most had witnessed or knew about the death of their other family members and had seen many crimes perpetrated against others. To avoid deportation and almost certain death, some Armenian women and girls converted to Islam and married Turks, Kurds, and Arabs. Those who refused were simply taken by the thousands from their families, convoys, orphanages, and camps. While many were raped and then killed, others were sold and enslaved, inspected and treated as chattel. Women and girls were systematically distributed to the Muslim population. As Dr. Aksham explained yesterday, this treatment served the plan for genocide. While estimates vary, the total number of Ottoman Armenians who were absorbed into our Muslim households is likely in the hundreds of thousands. Highlighting the gendered nature of the genocide, this group of survivors consisted primarily of women and children. A League of Nations commissionary who worked to, limit, to liberate Armenian women and girls and other children from Muslim households during and after the war, stated that the, of the thousands of Armenian females she had encountered, all but one had been sexually assaulted. Intake files of approximately 1,600 Armenian women and children compiled and currently housed in the League of Nations archives revealed another pattern. Many taken by Arab and Kurdish tribesmen were marked with tattoos on their hands and faces. The commissionary reported to the League of Nations that this tattooing had aroused much attention. She reported, as displayed on the slide, that the moral consequences of this procedure were distressing because the poor girls went around feeling that they had been branded in their faces for life, which in fact often prevented them from getting home they simply dared not show themselves to their countrymen. 
These photos were taken of survivors from the intake files. Dr. Aksham and two other scholars, including uh, Matthias Bornland, who I had mentioned previously, are currently working to translate and publish these documents in Turkish. They're currently in English because the staff members, even if English was not their first language, they recorded um, the uh, information about these individuals in English. This practice only enhanced the visibility of the crime against these women and girls and ensured their reintegration with the Armenian population would be increasingly difficult, if not impossible. A recent documentary called Grandma's Tattoos, directed and featuring Suzanne Kardalayan, and excuse me, I, I don't have uh, the background for proper pronunciation, um, shows the lasting effects of how these crimes were passed down through the generations. Growing up, she explains, she and other family members were unable to form a relationship with her grandmother but didn't know the reason why. She, she explains in the documentary that the blue tattoos on her grandmother's hands and on her face disgusted her. They were, she saw them as devilish signs that came from a dark world. Only now she realizes that they are they were the signs of violence and slavery. The story of those who didn't die, the story of the young women who survived and stayed behind has never been told. They were considered impure, tainted, and despised, yet they, had, they were the ones who suffered the most. And she also says um, that grandma did everything in order not to pass on the shame to us, but I know that it will never go away. It was only after her grandmother's death that the family looked into um, the origin of the tattoos and discovered that her grandmother had been raped as a child and then kept in captivity for several years. Sexual violence in the Armenian Genocide was also made highly visible by wit eyewitnesses, including survivors, diplomats, missionaries, intelligence officers, and even Ottoman soldiers themselves who reported on it. Even the New York Times reported on the, on the forced marriage and enslavement of Armenian girls. In this 1915 story spoke of um, how 100 schoolgirls were selected by Turkish officers and soldiers, with the rest being sold to the highest bidder. Another news report the same year described mass rape and sexual assault against Armenian deportees. Despite the widespread reports of sexual violence, the perpetrators were not held to account, even after the Ottoman defeat. Now, while justice has evaded Armenian victims of sexual violence, the horrors of their experience may have helped pave the way for future prosecution. The pattern of the crimes against them in very similar contexts has given rise to successful prosecutions. And the repetition of these crimes while unfortunate, has provided international courts with the opportunity to develop legal definitions and apply them in a gendered manner. The pattern of crimes in the Balkan conflict that le led to the breakup of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s bears a striking similarity to the Armenian expulsions and genocide perpetrated under the cover of war. Women were targeted for rape and other mistreatment as a, as a means used to humiliate and degrade them and their communities and force them out of the region. In Bosnia and Kosovo, the targeted ethnic groups were raped and sexually assaulted in their homes, during forcible displacement campaigns, in temporary or long-term detention settings, and as they fled in civilian convoys, often separated from their male family members. Gang rape was prevalent, as was the sexual torture of prisoners. Some victims were kept in private houses by soldiers for lengthy periods, used as sexual slaves, and then sold, ensuring further mistreatment. The strategy was largely successful. Within a short period, more than one million Bosnian Muslims and 700,000 Kosovo Albanians had been displaced from Serb-controlled areas. Although Rwanda is most notoriously known for the brutal slaughter of approximately 800,000 people over the course of three months in 1994, 
Investigations soon revealed that sexual violence formed an integral part of the genocidal attacks against Tutsi civilians. Hundreds of thousands of women and girls were raped during the Rwandan genocide. Sexual violence against Tutsi women inc included gang rape, rape with sticks and other objects, and other means of sexual mutilation. They were attacked throughout Rwanda during the genocide, often in the open, at, in roadblocks, military camps, in churches, schools, health clinics, stadiums, and markets. These crimes resulted in, quote, physical and psychological destruction of Tutsi women, their families, and their communities. That's from the Akayesu trial judgment, one of the first judgments issued by the ICTR. They were found to be genocidal acts because, quote, Tutsi women were subjected to sexual violence because they were Tutsi. Sexual violence was a step in the process of destruction of the Tutsi group, the destruction of the spirit, the will to live, and of life itself. The crimes involving sexual violence defined by the ICTY and ICTR demonstrate the varied ways in which it was used during the ethnically charged conflicts in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. While the statutes of the ICTY and the ICTR expressly criminalized rape, their chambers interpreted other crimes, including enslavement, torture, inhumane acts, cruel treatment, outrages upon personal dig dignity, persecution, and genocide as encompassing acts of sexual violence. In defining these crimes, and the applicable modes of liability, the ICTY and ICTR have interpreted and applied customary international law and general principles of law. The legal elements have been adopted and expanded upon by other international courts and tribunals, such as the Special Court for Sierra Leone the and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, which is the permanent court which now sits in The Hague. The Rome Statute of the ICC now specifically prohibits rape, sexual slavery, and forced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. Moving on to actually the proof of these crimes, we again see the relevance of history. This 1915 account came from a female survivor of, um, who disclosed what had happened to her and others. She, after her, the men had been taken away, she explained, then the turn came for the young women and girls. At midnight, they would come and take some of them away. You know, the Turks did a lot of things, but you cannot even talk about them. They did everything. If they liked them, they made them wives. If not, they would do all of their bad acts and then kill them. In 1992, you see a very similar situation with girls being taken away either never seen from again, or they, are, they were unwilling to talk about what had happened to them. Yet in um, one of the landmark cases before the ICTY, the trial took place between 1998 and 2001, and the judgment was issued in 2001. Um, several witnesses were willing to come forward, and they were given pseudonyms. Um, you can see they're just identified by numbers so that um, to keep their identities from the public because many had never told their family members. What, but they still disclosed the difficulty in coming forward with such evidence. The, um, witness 87 testified that she could not think about those things because she was exposed to too much torture and yet it was important for her to come forward and um, let the world know what those perpetrators had done. Another witness was unwilling to talk about it with her family, and yet she came forward and testified. Um, and she explained that everyone knew what had happened as um, they were taken away. A key difference was that there was actually accountability for the crimes committed in 1992. Um, those, the crimes against these girls was found to constitute torture and rape, both as a war crime and a crime against humanity, as well as outrages up upon personal dignity as a war crime. 
um, the long-term detention of girls for the purpose of sexual abuse and forced labor in soldiers' apartments was also prosecuted as enslavement as a crime against humanity. Mass rapes and sexual violence, sexual mutilations in Rwanda have found to constitute acts of genocide. As Professor Rothenberg has explained, the crime of genocide is not limited to killing, but also encompasses other acts, including serious bodily or mental harm committed with the intent to in destroy a national, ethnical, ethnical, racial, or religious group in whole or in part. And you can see there the elements of genocide. Um, the common elements are what, you have, what has to be proven with respect to each of those acts. You have to prove that the perpetrators harbored that specific intent. Um, and that has been probably the largest challenge to proving these crimes. Um, but again, it's not limited to killing. And in the cases of the ICTY and ICTR, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group um, has been affirmed as a quintessential example of serious bodily harm as an underlying act of genocide. Of course, many of the other underlying acts could also encompass sexual violence, but this is the element that has been most litigated before the ICTY and the ICTR. And again, this is referring to the legal definition of genocide, not the social definition or the moral definition. Um, another um, key, the most difficult element, again, is that has um, been, it's been really where cases have been unsuccessful, is not improving those underlying acts, but in uh, improving genocidal intent. Um, most perpetrators don't go around um, leaving documentation about why they commit mass crimes. And that's certainly the case with genocide. But the courts have found that specific intent can be inferred through a number of facts and circumstances, such as the general context, the perpetration of other culpable acts systematically directed against this targeted population, and the repetition of destructive and discriminatory acts. And the relevance of sexual violence is um, that it, it doesn't only constitute an underlying act, serious bodily or mental harm, but it can be evidence of this specific intent to destroy. And that has been confirmed um, by the appeals chamber at the ICTY. Now, it's been, um, the, the jurisprudence has confirmed that um, sexual violence does constitute core crimes under international law. Um, but despite these successes and more precisely defining these crimes, relatively few, few political and military leaders have been convicted. This is largely due to the fact that they will rarely order or publicly direct sexual violence or even expressly contemplate it in formulating their criminal plans. However, there is some precedent for holding leaders accountable for allowing sexual violence to occur in pursuing the goals of ethnic cleansing and genocide, even where sexual violence was not specifically planned or directed. As in domestic criminal law, international criminal law incorporates various modes of li liability aimed at holding persons responsible for crimes beyond the physical perpetrators. Under the ICTY and ICTR statutes, perpetrators can be convicted for committing, planning, ordering and instigating, aiding and abetting, as well as superior responsibility. And committing encompasses various forms of co-perpetration, including joint criminal enterprise liability, which aims to, to punish individuals who participate in a common plan to commit crimes. The common plan usually involves crimes on a, a massive scale, requiring many co-perpetrators to work together to accomplish their task. Participa participants in criminal, criminal enterprise are also responsible for other crimes that are a national, natural and foreseeable consequences of Im implementing the common purpose. 
Similarly, before the permanent court, the ICC, perpetrators are responsible for consequences that will occur in the ordinary course of events. And this comes down to um, basically a standard that doesn't require that the perpetrator intended the crime, but that they knew that it would likely occur as a result of their um, conduct. In making such arguments, prosecutors have highlighted the existence of particular indicators that reinforce the predictability of sexual violence. And among them are the very same factors that put Armenian women and girls at risk at the, and at the mercy of their attackers century, a century ago. For example, a Bosnian Serb commander was convicted of rapes during the Srebrenica genocide that were foreseeable given the lack of shelter, the density of crowds, and the vulnerable condition of the refugees, as well as the presence of military and paramilitary units, and the lack of sufficient protection. Now, despite these strides, in two Kosovo cases, trial chambers acquitted military and political leaders for sexual assaults that occurred in the course of the ethnic cleansing of Albanians during the NATO bombing. And um, there was one dissent from the acquittal um, who explained that where violence is used to displace large numbers of civilians, including women, um, history and common sense um, indicate that sexual assaults um, were foreseeable and therefore they should have been accountable. Um, the prosecution appealed and um, was successful and we do now have appellate jurisprudence that can be used in future prosecutions for sexual violence um, which really highlighted these factors that made it foreseeable and if you look at these factors, the vulnerability, lack of protection, um, exposure to abuse and mistreatment, separation from male family members, and um, being targeted on, on the basis of ethnicity. This decision could have just as well been written in 1915. And so in conclusion, um, I think this just highlights the importance of remembering history as we move forward, trying to combat impunity for these crimes which continue to occur. We have the information, we have the data, and we, um, we need that to convince judges that these crimes are indeed foreseeable and that um, perpetrators should be held to account for them. Um, I'm just putting some information about the book that will be coming out hopefully later this year that includes a chapter on this subject as, many, as well as many other subjects that are being covered during this conference. And if anyone's interested in the topic, I invite you to contact me at the email address. Thank you. My name's uh, Robert Clinton. I teach here at the uh, Arizona State uh, uh, University uh, at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, and I wanted to thank Jennifer and Zari for putting together just an outstanding conference and inviting me uh, to talk. As I've been sitting here listening to the outstanding uh, presentations of Professor Rothenberg and uh, Professor Omnapti and, and Mark Garagos, I was, I must say, struck by the commonality of techniques involved in genocide. Whether sitting, listening about tattooing, making me remember the tattoos on friends' arms derived from the Holocaust in Germany, or the relocation of people from their native lands to other lands and their dispersal. Uh, affecting uh, both the Jewish people, the tribe from which I come, and indigenous peoples, uh, the tribes with which I work. Um, and what I want to do today is to try to tie together some of those themes by focusing in on uh, uh, Native Americans and their story, and uh, looking at the question of genocide through uh, those eyes. Um, and asking serious questions about whether these really were genocides and what remediation is possible 
and what has been effective. And in the process, possibly some lesson can be learned for the healing of the Armenian uh, experience. Um, I want to begin sort of with two critical questions. One, did the displacement of the indigenous populations of North America constitute a genocide? And it turns out, for some of the reasons Professor Rothenberg suggests, this is a very complex question. It's unquestionably ethnocide. There's absolutely no question that everybody was trying to do away with native culture. But was it genocide? Well, it certainly wasn't genocide in any accepted definition then because we didn't get an accepted definition until 1948. But if we apply that definition retrospectively, does the population collapse I'm about to talk about um, really qualify as genocide? I'm not gonna come to a resolution of that. I'm just gonna give you the underlying facts and let you draw your own conclusions. Clearly not all mass population collapses of the type we witnessed in North and for that matter, South America, are genocide. They're not all brought about by external forces. Um, there are complex problems um, and the question I want to raise, of course, is whether all Holocaust-like population collapses qualify under the definition of genocide. Um, uh, Professor Rothenberg beat me to it. Obviously, the Khmer Rouge example, the Pol Pot example, raises serious questions about what actually is genocide and how many of the components of the definition that we have in the International Convention must be uh, uh, present. But the second thing I want to talk about is something my people, the Jewish people, have focused a lot on. Healing, not forgetting, building history, the motto of Yad Vashem in Israel. Um, but what can we do to remediate, to seek restitution, to make sure that subsequent generations do not live with a cultural identity of victimization and genocide, and what have Native Americans done in that respect? So those two questions are sort of what I want to talk about. Now, I'm just going to remind you of the legal definition. Dan's already done a wonderful uh, dramatic reading of it. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, put the definition up to remind you of the UN definition in Article 2 on the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And from there, I want to talk about the native population collapse in North America. The estimates in North America are that prior to contact, 1491, though that's not quite contact in North America, that there were roughly somewhere between 2.1 million and 18 million indigenous people in North America. That gives me a mean between the various estimates of 9.4, and my methodology is, let's just take the mean of the estimates. It's gotta be somewhere close to right. Strangely enough, people don't seem to be estimating the population in the United States, but they are estimating the population in Canada. And there the ranges are from 200,000 to 2 million, giving a mean of roughly, there's not supposed to be a dollar sign, it's supposed to be a million sign, uh, 1.8 million. That means that the mean estimate in the United States was approximately 7.6 million indigenous people living in the United States prior to contact. They had thriving civilizations in large cities. There's a dig uh, in Illinois, just east of St. Louis, the Cahokia area, where the Cahokia Mounds are, that suggest Cahokia was the center of a thriving city that was larger than London at the time much more complicated, a greater trade complex, et cetera. We know, if you look south, that the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans had major civilization complexes, cities functioning long before contact. Even in the southwest here, the Chaco trade complex, located just to the northeast of us, was a massive trade complex that flourished at least until the 1500s. Um, and was a very significant um, uh, group of folks uh, living uh, independently and without much contact at all, though they had had some contact with the Spanish um, before the uh, uh, collapse occurred. No, I guess they hadn't before the collapse occurred. The 1890 census 
reports the Indian population in the United States at 290,000. Now, by my calculations, that means between 1491 and 1890, roughly 400 years, there was a 96.2% population collapse of Indians in North America. More than nine out of 10 Now, of course, that wasn't more than nine out of 10 died in one generation. But what it means is that thriving civilizations and cultures that existed in North America were destroyed. They weren't just culturally destroyed. Their people were destroyed by the fact of contact and the advance of contact. Now, the question is, how did that happen? Well, it turns out the, com the how it happened is much more complicated than the romantic story that's frequently told. It turns out that probably more than half, possibly as much as 75 or 80 percent, of the loss was caused by disease, by the simple fact of contact. Medical professionals talk about something called a virgin soil epidemic. What's a virgin soil epidemic? It's an epidemic caused by the introduction of a pathogen into a community that had, had absolutely no exposure to it. And therefore, over time, has developed no immunities to it. What does that mean? Well, many of you may have had the flu. For you, the flu, because you've built up some immunity over time, was debilitating for a couple of days, but except in extreme cases, not lethal. If you've not been exposed to the flu as an entire continental community, the death toll from the flu can be quite substantial. Worse still, these communities were economically interdependent. If all of your hunters are suddenly all down with the flu and no one's hunting, it's not just those who have the flu who are sick and possibly die. It's the rest of the community who are dependent on those hunters for food. Or if it's an agricultural community, and there were many, if the women are all down with the flu because they engaged in many communal activities and therefore, if one got sick, many got sick. Nobody's planting at planting season. And over time, that has serious adverse consequences for the health of the entire community. Now, there have been some scholars who've tried somewhat unsuccessfully, and in one case resulted in a, a claim of academic misconduct, to tie disease to a deliberate weapon of war. We do know of one British general who during the colonial period did try to introduce the disease which the 16th century drawing of Aztecs by the Spaniards, uh, smallpox, tried to introduce smallpox into communities as a weapon of war. There's not much systematic evidence that disease was thought of as a weapon of war. It tended to precede contact, or I shouldn't say, it pretended to precede contact and follow trade routes. So for example, there were early contacts of explorers on the East Coast who found thriving Algonquian communities, where in Cape Cod and Massachusetts. But of course, they brought diseases with them. By the time the pilgrims landed, Cape Cod was substantially depopulated. How'd that happen? Well, it wasn't warfare with Europeans on Cape Cod. It was the diseases that I'm talking about. Specifically, what diseases? We don't know. But clearly, disease played a major role in this population. Warfare, and by that I mean both sides being armed, and equally importantly, massacres 
And by that I mean primarily one side being armed, attacking unarmed folks on the other side. Examples of that might be the Sand Creek Massacre, where Colorado volunteers attacked Southern Cheyenne, who were waving a white flag and weren't armed and were at peace with the United States and proudly showed their peace medal to the, United, to the attacking soldiers as they were slaughtered. Or the West Cheetah Massacre, and you see the example of that in this drawing on the lower plains as the Calvary just charges into a village who wasn't resisting them and did not attack them. Or the worst example, the Wounded Knee Massacre where hundreds of unarmed Lakota who had already been disarmed were attacked by whom? By the 7th Cavalry, Custer's former unit, and massacred as they were simply trying to seek refuge with their relatives at uh, Pine Ridge or at Rosebud. Another cause is displacement and relocation. Our policies of settlement forced Indians out of what? Of their farming areas, of their hunting areas, of the areas by which they made their living and lived. The worst example, though it's certainly not the only one, is the massive relocation of Indians, paralleling ethnic cleansing elsewhere. The massive relocation to something we euphemistically call the Indian Territory. It wasn't their Indian territory. Actually, there were other Indians living there, but we just tried to remove all the Indians to it. Why? So we could clear their areas in the southeast, in the northeast, in the Minnesota, Iowa area. For what? For non-Indian settlement. So we could take their lands. Picture you have is of the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears. Many of the southeastern tribes were removed on their own version of the Trail of Tears. They were herded up by the army, marched in the dead of winter without any provisions. From where? From basically Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, to where? To eastern Oklahoma. Through where? Through Illinois in the dead of winter. Approximately a quarter of the tribe died on the Trail of Tears. Only about three quarters of it re was actually removed. The other quarter quite literally headed for the hills. What hills? The Smoky Mountains. And the eastern band of Cherokee can still be found. Where? In the Smoky Mountains. Where heading for the hills wound up being a survival strategy. Land loss was a significant cause of, of depopulation and part of the relocation. This is a map which isn't quite accurate because it doesn't start in 1491 and showing all of North America in Indian hands. It sort of picks up in 1784 where the uh, uh, brown areas are basically Indian occupied and Indian owned areas. Um, and you should notice a very significant shrinkage of, in fact, the Indian areas in the United States over time and over the various periods. And, of course, surviving as your land base is being taken away from you when you're tied for survival to land, when your culture is based on land, when your economy is based on either farming or hunting, well, if you don't have land to farm, or worse still, you can't go where the animals go. If you're a hunter, guess what? You tend to starve. And that also contributed to the population collapse. Cultural and economic destruction actually sometimes was very clearly a national policy. By the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, most of the East Coast and of the West Coast had had their tribes displaced onto reservations. But the Northern and Southern Plains had not. And what was the economy of the Northern and Southern Plains? Buffalo hunting. 
It's not great agricultural land. I used to judge out there. Not a lot of wheat being grown in North Dakota or South Dakota. Um, buffalo hunting. So what did we do? We sent Buffalo Bill out to kill all the buffalo. It's going to be a lot easier to pacify Indians if they're starving than if they can roam those plains looking for their food source. And the railroads opened up that area to that kind of activity. And here you see the hides of 40,000 buffalo killed by those buffalo hunters just in one year. Their carcasses were left to rot, all that meat, on the plains. They just took the hides. Those carcasses were the Lakotas and the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes grocery store. And that meat was not usable by them. Starvation became a significant reality. Another cause of population collapse was cultural and economic destruction and starvation. And here we see the results of the boarding schools on one Navajo. We sent Indians off to boarding schools to become essentially non-Indians, to be educated as non-Indians. And this is one Navajo five months after he was taken out of Navajo country and sent to the Carlisle School, where who? Jim Thorpe played football. Carlisle was one of those boarding schools. We outlawed Indian cultural practices. We outlawed Indian dances in the Code of Indian Offenses in 1883, driving the Sundance underground. We outlawed the practice of medicine men. We outlawed the practice of gift giving for a woman's hand in marriage. We outlawed potlatching, which is a major gift giving feast which is a means of economic exchange in traditional communities. These were all made illegal. They were made misdemeanors. And by the way, what was the penalty for all of this? Well, we took away your rations. Well, by the way, we've already taken away your economy. What happens when we take away your rations? You starve. 96% population collapse. We also destroyed tribal governments. We displaced them. The best example of that displacement is the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Notice I said the Kingdom of Hawaii. Hawaii was an internationally recognized country, for those who don't know it, an indigenous country. It had a king. A lot of European countries had treaties with it. The United States had treaties with it. We overthrew it in 1890. This is Ileana Palace, the home of the uh, king and queen, which still exists in Hawaii, if you want to go see it. Um, and of course, quickly annexed Hawaii in 1898, even though we admitted that it was illegal. Well, just as the Nuremberg Laws facilitated the Nazi Holocaust, other legal doctrines facilitated all of this. Like what? I'll just tick them off. The Doctrine of Discovery, the treaties to take the land, uh, which were basically exchanges in form, but they were the way that land destruction happened. The plenary power doctrine of Congress, the claim that Congress has complete control over these tribal governments and can take their power away anytime they want, which emerged in the late 19th century as our colonial expansion ex uh, continued. The unrecognized nature of aboriginal title. I've talked about the Code of Indian Offenses and many laws beginning in 1885 uh, including the Dawes General Allotment Act that displaced uh, tribal government. Let me very quickly get to remedies. I'll spend maybe five minutes if that's okay. Little at all was done except a couple of statutes authorizing some litigation until after World War II and after the Holocaust. And one suspects the human rights record of Germany made the United States very concerned about its treatment of Indians. And quickly after World War II, it enacted a statute called the Indian Claims Commission that was primarily a way to give money, to give the kinds of restitution that Mark was talking about to Indians for bad past practices, but it generally was only about land, didn't do anything for the population collapse. The court that was established, the Indian Claims Commission, ruled that loss of sovereignty was not cognizable, 
the loss of culture was not cognizable. It's only if we took your land away and didn't pay for it that in fact uh, we'll actually give you some money now. The long-term incarceration of uh, the Hirakawa Apache, the uh, Geronimo's band. 50 years of incarceration of the people, literal incarceration. Not cognizable under the Indian Claims Commission Act. And many think that act was a prelude to further wrongs, including the termination policy of the 50s that I don't have time to talk about. Apologies. There have been a couple of apologies. My colleague, Kevin Gover, who now runs the Museum of uh, the Native American, uh, National Museum of the American uh, and Indian, in, at the Smithsonian, who's a member of this faculty on leave, um, actually offered an apology to Indians on behalf of the BIA when he was the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. But it didn't have the force of Congress or the government backing it. He just thought it was the right thing to do. Ironically, Canada and Australia, which both had boarding schools, have formally apologized to, for them. Have we? No. Congress has, however, apologized for overthrowing the Kingdom of Hawaii, recognizing that that was wrong. Formal apology in 1990. Uh, are we giving Hawaii back to the Hawaiians? Uh, no. So the apology, in fact, uh, has gone some way. We've litigated old claims based on a 1966 statute, including Indian claims. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has now brought that to a grinding halt. There's been a halting federal recognition project to re-recognize tribes that we've ignored. We've established an increasing focus on government-to-government -government relationships. And we've tried to re-establish Indian economies that have been decimated by the kinds of things I've just talked about. Through what? The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, all those casinos you see on Indian reservations are an effort to do exactly that. It's a form of restitution in another way. Or the Indian Mineral Development Act, a good example to facilitate Indians being able to more effectively exploit and benefit from their remedies. But to conclude, the real remedy is with the tribes themselves. The real hard work of repairing damage is with the tribes themselves. On the anniversary of Wounded Knee, the various Lakota tribes held a wiping the way, uh, away the tears ride to commemorate Wounded Knee and to heal and recognize that the problem was what do we do going forward, not merely the past. And many tribes, this happens to be the Winnebago Tribal Council, worked very hard to do exactly that. So it is ultimately sovereignty of tribes that has been the most important thing for healing. It is ultimately their collective ability as self-governing peoples that has worked to create a better future for them and the possibility of rebuilding after this kind of a holocaust just as it has been the emergence of the State of Israel for my people, the Jewish people, that has been so critically important in healing and bringing the world's attention to the problems of genocide and the problems of the Shoah. And I was fascinated to hear Mark talk about the reemergence of Armenia as a vehicle for doing precisely the same thing because that's what's worked for natives. It has definitely helped the Jewish people and hopefully will be the lighthouse for the recovery from the Armenian genocide. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for very interesting presentations. We uh, only have a few minutes left. Uh, Jenna, can we go a little past three or do we need to end? maybe five minutes. So uh, you've been very patient. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions or very brief comments. And there is a microphone around. So, so, the, convention, so the, the convention doesn't create a mechanism of remedy. No, not necessarily remedy. So, so it does. I mean, it, it literally says in this preamble, you know, recognizing that at all periods of history, genocide has inflicted great losses on humanity as a preamble to then the legal document. So it's clear that the United Nations envisioned uh, uh, the, the acknowledgement and the recognition of past genocides as part of the process 
of creating this legal document, right? But at the same time, one of the things that's missing from the, this whole process is, even though the, the, um, the convention envisions some sort of legal body, that doesn't really come into effect until fairly recently. So there's sort of a history and evolution. To some degree, if you want to feel positive about all of this, you know, if you want to be, uh, you can see that, and I would argue this, that a lot changed with the creation of the Genocide Convention. It gave a term. We can, we can have a conference with this term to pull us together. In the absence of that term, when there wasn't a naming process, you know, it didn't mean that the horror of these actions was any less horrible. But I actually think it's fair to say that without a term to pull all of this together, the, the acts are conceptualized differently. As, as Mark mentioned, right, like you go to, you, you speak on Larry King and you say genocide, it's substantively different than if you say terrible things occurred, killings, rapes. I think that's fair to say, right? So something is happening with the creation of this and we've seen a substantive evolution in the usefulness of genocide. Um, although to answer your question really concretely, the convention itself doesn't, specifically mention particular past genocides. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I mean, the genocide lasted 100 days. So, to, so even though you're absolutely right that even though the United States and, and many, you know, the vast majority of states have taken on the genocide convention obligations, and there is an obligation to act to prevent and punish genocide. So there was no international action to prevent genocide, although at the same time it really wasn't, it, it didn't last very long and it ended because uh, an armed group beat back the, the Hutu power government. So, so you had, you know, the, a Tutsi um, revolutionary or, 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 you know, insurgent movement that militarily defeated the Hutu power government. But, you know, there, that doesn't excuse the lack of international action. I guess if you wanted to feel, uh, frankly, the Rwandan genocide, I think, was a huge slap in the face or a recognition of the weakness of the global promises of never again and the promises to act to prevent and punish genocide. I suppose if you want to feel good about it, you could say, well, at le well the world did act to punish in that it created international tribunals in the wake of the Yugoslav conflict and also the Rwandan conflict. But I don't think that should be any, like, um, that doesn't minimize your point, which is that that states did not jump into the fray and seek to prevent the, the genocide. If I could just add, uh, since then, there has been the development of the idea of the responsibility to protect, which is an attempt to try to put pressure on the international community to actually act to prevent uh, grave violations of human rights, including genocide. But again, that still is very much uh, incomplete, I would say. Um, is that um, there were there was actually a cry for help from the UN peacekeepers at the time. It did, it happens. Uh, it did happen fast, but there, um, you know, there are books written by people who are on the ground um, to really um, address uh, the failure of the peacekeeping that occurred in the talks about the complex reasons for inaction during the actual genocide, but again, the tribunal um, and the action by the I think we just have time for one more question. Uh, I have to choose among you now. So, uh, gentlemen there, please. Yes. Look, you, you hit the nail on the head. The reason that there, why did Israel have such a problem? It was because at a certain point, Israel had a symbiotic relationship with Turkey. Why does the U.S. now have a problem? Because the U.S. has a relationship with Turkey that they are afraid of uh, upsetting. The way to solve the problem is to just adopt the NRA strategy, and I don't mean pick up rifles or, or shotguns. <laughs> I mean every election cycle take out some feckless congressman and just like the NRA does, and that would solve the problem uh, within three election cycles. So, I mean, it is a political movement. The Turks understand that. That's why they pump money in. That's why they hire ex-congressmen who at least had the moral clarity when they were in Congress, like Gephardt, to do the right thing. And as soon as they leave, they sell their soul, or the same thing that Livingston did. So the only way to get around that is to take them out. All right, well uh, I'm, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know there are other questions. Maybe you could uh, talk to the panelists during the break uh, if you do, still do have questions.
But I want to thank you all for coming, and I particularly want to thank our panelists for four fascinating presentations. So thank you.